when I pick up the dumbbell, the center of gravity is centered in my palm right here. I may have a little bit of this going on, but there's nothing above my hand or below my hand. So this center of gravity is pretty fixed within my palm. Now, if I have a kettlebell, depending on where I am within the movement, it has an extended moment arm of resistance. So what that means is the resistance is extended away from my palm. Oh, BJ Gador with the BJ Gador podcast. And what an episode I have in store for you today. Look, back in the day, I'll say around 2006, 2007, kettlebell started to enter the States. All right. And there was at the time, the number one RKC instructor. His name was Jason C. Brown. I call him JCB. One of the sexiest. He's a sex icon. I'm not going to lie to you. This man is a sexual icon, but this is where I learned how to use kettlebells from. And this guy is so unique. Uh, you know, in the fitness space, there's a lot of clout chasing fake ass people. And one thing about Jason is he's just like former Marine. He's a busy dad. He uh, works from home. He has evolved his training along the way. And uh, one of the kindest, funniest uh, people that I've come across in the industry. Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of friends in the industry. Shout out to Drake. Um, but he's one of those guys that I've always considered a friend, someone I look up to and respect. And again, people ask, you know, I want kettlebell stuff. Well, this is the guy I learned from. So we're going to talk today about a bunch of stuff. You know, kettlebells versus dumbbells, the battle of the bells. We'll talk about the top three kettlebell training mistakes, the top five kettlebell moves, ballistics versus grinds. We'll also get into fit over 50. Jason is 51, okay? And when you see him, I'm about to, like, he's behind scenes right now. I'm going to unveil him to the world here. This guy's in incredible shape. He looks amazing. And again, he, he's not one of those, those guys that lives in the gym. He's all about physical culture and education, making movement a practice versus something that people obsess over. And uh, we'll also talk about Qigong and breath work, uh, stuff that he's working on today. So before I introduce or let Jason start talking here, quick housekeeping issues. Number one, show sponsors, okay? The TDBJ app. You can see it right here, all right? Add free access to all my content, thousands of routines, including this exclusive content. I'll actually bring it up right here that we're going to be working on with Jason. The Kettlebell Chaos Collection, okay? He's got a beginner kettlebell series, three different workouts. You can rotate between a bunch of routines. Again, exclusive to the dailybj.com. Get a free trial link in show notes. Also, our apparel line, sleeves sold separately, manufactured in downtown LA, sleeves sold separately.com. I'm wearing one of our items here. The wife lover or husband lover tank top. So soft. Look at the fit, Jason. You can see it highlights the collarbone, my, my awesome chest here, that little taco salad. Uh, by the way, I've, I've been starting to get uh, chips, chip crumbs in my chest here. So there's always a snack for later. Um, and also, Athletic Greens get a free travel packs, five free travel packs, and a one-year supply of vitamin D through my link. The only supplement I take every day, a greens powder, but also a complete multivitamin. So Lincoln show us again. So let's get into it here. Because you've got to go. This guy's busy, man. we got an hour here. We're going to give you guys so much information and content. Please be sure to like, share, subscribe. JCB, welcome to the show, my friend. BJ, my dear friend, so happy to be here with you. Thank you for having me on. Dude, this is, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun today. And you're also one of those guys, people think I'm drinking a beer. This is Topo Chico. Okay, I'm trying to get a new sponsor for the show. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll catch up like once every five years. Honestly, that, we should stop that. we got to kind of stay in touch better. But we pick up just like we did. Like It was it was like yesterday. Um, it's because you're just one of those dudes and, and – uh, I just, I've just always enjoyed you, man. And, uh, you know, I got to ask you this to start. We're going to get into your origin story and kind of how everything took place here. But I, I, my initial expectations of you, because, again, before I met you and went to your, your, your class or workshop, you know, I see this picture of this good-looking guy with a kettlebell like this and uh, number one RKC instructor. So I was expecting someone that had a big ego, kind of a showboat. And, and you were like – because that, that was my experience up until that point and fitness and, and you were just the exact opposite you just have a humility about you um do you sometimes feel like or, or along the way did you feel like you were just like almost a pariah in the fitness community like 
you just didn't belong. I, I, I felt that way a lot of ways because, you know, I just I don't have a lot of people in that space that resonated with me or the way I would, you know, I don't know. Do you, do you get what I'm trying to say? Or are you like, please, next question? <laughs> no, PJ, I did not feel like that when we first started out. And I felt very much at home. So I've been professionally training since 1999. I did not feel like that initially, but now I feel very much like that. Like I, I feel like I have no home. And I feel like, quite honestly, I share this with other people that are maybe my age or in similar positions within this industry. I feel like I've never been more lost in this field, in this endeavor, trying to help people, trying to spread good work. I'm lost and I know a lot of people that are lost right alongside me. But back in the day, like 1990, like, again, I've been training since 99, 99 through the early 2000s, I felt right at home. I felt solid. I felt strong. I felt like I was doing good work. I felt like uh, I was within a good community. There were always different factions within that community, but I didn't mind that. I like a good debate. I like a good argument. You've seen me argue once or twice with people in, in our world. Um, but now I totally feel like that. Like I just feel, I think unqualified people have stepped into the, the, the industry. The gate, the barrier for entry was always a little bit low, but now it's much, much lower. And now we have people that have never even spent time working in the real world with real human beings actually you, you know trying to adjust humans have become experts online and they i don't know how i mean you and i both know how because the uh, technology is such a wonderful thing and you use it and leverage it quite well but now i must admit i feel like i'm an outsider but i'm happy with that because i'll work with my little community center old folks doing tai chi with them and qigong and i'll let the sexy bj gadors and his little <laughs> and his athleisure wear and i'll let all the hot mamas in their bikinis demonstrate the kettlebell swings if that makes sense you know look it does man and look i think a lot of it has to do um because again i I've, I've never just turned 40 recently i'm 41 now and you know like it's a weird industry to be in because technically like i'm an old man yes. in a young man's game um and it's like well put this guy out to pasture already but you know i feel like at the same time i finally feel equipped to really do people's service because now i have a wisdom and experience that you know frankly i had all the ambition and the desire and passion uh, when I got started in my 20s, like probably like you did too, right? Where you're motivated by so many different things. Um, but I, I frankly, I just wasn't ready to be the expert. But the thing is, you got you got to start, you know. And, and so it, it, we have to be careful because I find myself doing this sometimes, like being these grumpy old men. Yeah, because you know, this, this is what happens with generations, right? You look at these these idiots the way they're doing it now, <laughs> looking out yes. your window, and, you know, stuck inside. At the same time, like it is now, like everyone is in this space now, and, and like we hated the gatekeepers back in the day, but it's almost like uh, can we swing back halfway so that you know people aren't so negatively influenced by just the superficial piece of fitness, how someone looks, the way someone speaks, versus you know the the actual content uh, that they're sharing. So you know, all we can do is is. Like, and you and I are also someone in the sense, I feel like if we were like, we were designed to be, we're like cavemen, frankly, right? Like we like to have a small little community, a nice yes. inner circle, family first, small, close friends. We're not about, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get our name and stuff out there because we got to make a living, but uh, we would be fine as long as we got the lifestyle we're looking for without the fame, without the clout, without all of this other bullshit that's in the space. So. That's why I want to get you on. Like I try to bring on people that are just in, in, in my encounters, the best I ever encountered. And you were when it came to kettlebell training. Obviously, you've done you're an expert beyond kettlebell training, but you 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 got into it like um I want to kind of talk about that too, because 
like obviously this is a tool that's been around a long time. Yeah. So there was this whole naturalist movement in early German, well, not early Germany, but you know, early 1900s, where they trained outside naked, got the sunlight where the sunlight shined, and they did swinging and everything. But uh, so I was blessed with a great uh, jujitsu coach originally. His name was Stephen Maxwell. Uh, Stephen Maxwell is Stephen Maxwell. He had the first Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy on the East Coast. And he his academy, Jiu Jitsu Academy, actually predated any of the Gracies on the East Coast. Um, but he was, a, I think the term that he would use is physical culture. He was a forerunner in physical culture. Like he had sandbags before anybody had sandbags. He had clubs before anyone had clubs. This is the like 94, 95. I was never in a gym that had gymnastics rings unless it was an actually a gymnastics center. Steve's Jiu Jitsu Academy had gymnastics rings, and then we didn't see those again until CrossFit became popular. Steve actually had a member uh, of his Jiu Jitsu school, Rusty Wright was the gentleman's name, who was a metal shop worker, who uh, formed these ancient kettlebells with a big steel ball bearing and then he welded these like square handles onto them. i am now the proud custodian of these kettlebells that i bought from steve they're not very accurate one is like 53 the other one is 57 but they're beautiful bells you can use them for swings you can use them for snatches cleans they're a little bit the clearance is a little bit too tight but that was my first introduction to kettlebell training and if you look at the first Pavel's first book, Russian Kettlebell Challenge, there's a photo of Steve and his son, Zach, in the back, listing a program for kettlebell training for Brazilian jiu-jitsu athletes or, or artists. And you can see those bells, and you can see a photo of Steve's uh, Maxercise was the name of the academy. So I was blessed with early exposure to those old-school tools, those physical culture tools, via my jiu-jitsu coach, Steve Maxwell. Steve had those kettlebells before Dragon Door was even a thing or Pavel was even a thing. Pavel was doing workshops on like flexibility and, and relaxing to stretch and all of his flexibility workshops, but he was not speaking about kettlebells. And then Pavel's business coach, John Duquesne, was like, this is a gold mine. We have to start talking about kettlebells. And then that's when the kettlebells became commercially available. But for very few select individuals at Stephen Maxwell's Jiu Jitsu Academy in Philadelphia, we were exposed to kettlebell training early on. And then, how did you get on the track of becoming an RKC instructor? And again, you're talking about Dragon Door, too, which, like, they have some of the, not, I mean, there's been books forever on, on the topic of exercise, but uh, they had a, a real big run with, you know, convict conditioning, all the, the Pavel books, uh, you know. Uh, the grease, the groove stuff, like really yeah. great stuff. Uh, very simple, like minimalist. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I've always identified with that style. I don't like to complicate. And, and so, but obviously you had to go through, you know, a, a rigorous, um, I, I've, I've heard of like people finish this course and like their hands are bleeding from all the snatches. Uh, take us through how you, you rose through the ranks and then kind of started your own organization on uh, kettlebell athletics. I think BJ, I was just fortunate because it was so, so early on, there was just a, like a nice little cadre of people that were willing to devote themselves to the art and the science of kettlebell training that I was maybe like one of seven guys that were devoted to this. Philadelphia actually had one of the first kettlebell clubs called the Philadelphia Kettlebell Club. And it was like, the, like you know, some of the best years of my life, but we were we would meet every weekend we would barbecue we would kettlebell train we would talk about technique we would you know test one another and again i i was i don't want to say i was i was fortunate i was in the right place at the right time and i was exposed to good coaching early on for example i'm sure you're aware that there's uh two kettlebell well now there's probably about six thousand but Early on, there was two kettlebell camps. There was the American Kettlebell Club, Valerie Fedorenko, 
and he was a GS or a gear of voice sport champion in, in former Soviet Union. And that, that is the GS technique or the soft style technique. The Philadelphia Kettlebell Club, he was actually, I may be incorrect, but I believe he was just like a, you know, he was an immigrant. He came here, he was a furniture mover. He was moving refrigerators. And then we found out that this kettlebell champion was living in Chicago. And we flew him out to Philadelphia to show us those gear boy sport techniques. So we had early exposure to Steve, first of all. Then we had early exposure to Pavel because Pavel would come out and do workshops in Philly. And then we had the early exposure to Valerie Federenko for the GS work or the kettlebell sport work. So. And then what was what was required to get certified? Because you know, I think one thing they did so well, and that when we've seen this, uh, and, and I actually use in this case that a cult in a positive way, because you you want to create a community and you do that. Uh, if you want to be inclusive, but at the same time too, if you are doing things everyone can do, it's not special. So you really have to run that line. And so they made it tough. Not everyone could get through this or, or would want to go through the, the rigorous uh, training required to get certified. And obviously it, it almost was kind of like a martial arts, uh, you know, there's different ranks you can climb up to and, uh, you know, and then it's evolved. It was like, uh, it was RKC. Then I think it's, it became strong first, but yes. uh, like, what did you have to do to give people an idea what that looked like for you to kind of get initially certified and then kind of rise through the ranks? So did, they, they, did they really test you and push you? So you, I was in before any official test was made standard. So there, okay. was no, there was no snatch test or anything like that. But this, these early groups, these early cadres, they were Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, like eight to 10 hours per day. And there was there, it was such a small community that it was like real recognizes real, if that makes sense. Yes. Like uh, there were these early things called the tactical strength challenges, and it was two weight categories, and you had to do pistols with the fifty-three pound belt. So if you were one of these guys that could do pistols and pull-ups with a fifty-three pound belt, it was sort of accepted or assumed that you knew what you were doing with the belts, right? So I forget, it's been a long time, BJ, but like there was two different categories, one for the 30 32 kilo bell and then one for the 24 kilo bell. And the events were different. I think uh, it was double front squats for the 24 kilo and then pull-ups and then pistols. There was a lot of different changes being made early on as well. But those first few early certifications, and to be quite honest, I think Pavel, and Dragon Door and John Duquesne, I think they were in the process of going with the flow and improvising exactly what would occur on those three-day weekends. I'm sure they test it. Well, that was too much for those individuals. That was too little for those individuals. Are we actually ensuring quality instructors? You know, I've seen lots of people fail because they missed one um, one rep on the snatch test. And it broke my heart because I knew them personally and I knew they could coach these skills so well. And I knew they were quality coaches, but because they weren't up to, you know, up to the shape of snatching 124, 100 reps in the snatch, they would fail the weekend. And it would have just break my heart because I knew they were quality coaches. So I'm actually, I consider, I'm glad I got in before the snatch test because I think of, I think it actually backfired. I think people went in and passed because they were in good shape, but they didn't pass because their coaching quality was there. They passed because their fitness quality was there, if that makes sense. It does. Can, can you tell us exactly what this snatch test was, like the weight and, and how you got to those 100 reps? And like, was it a time thing or how'd that work? It's been so long, BJ. It was 100 snatches. I think it was in five minutes. And, and again, it, I think it went through a few evolutions, right? I think, I think you could, originally you could do one hand switch, like a gear boy sport or a kettlebell sport. And again, if, if there's any experts listening to this episode, they can correct me because it's been literally like 25, 30 years now, like somewhere around there, right? So 2003, yeah, right? 20 years, I'm sorry, 20 years. 
I think the first snatch test was 100 snatches in five minutes, and you could only use one hand switch. Now it's as many hand switches as you want. I believe I'm not involved in that world anymore. As many hand switches as you want, you can actually set the bell down. I remember the first few tests that we had, everyone tore calluses because we did not know that very refined gear voice sport technique. We were using sort of the crude technique that we originally learned from Pavel uh, and from, you know, we, we, man, it was the wild west. We were like, let's do this. We, we used friction improperly. We used improper techniques. And now the techniques are just light years ahead of, ahead of what we were exposed to back then. So I think the first test was 100 snatches in five minutes, one hand switch. And then everybody observed that everyone's hands were bloody and messed up for the rest of the weekend. And I think they actually did the snatch test on the Friday. You show up, you do your snatch test, you wreck your hands, and then you hate life for the next three days. So I, it went through a lot of evolutions. Um, but again, I'm not, I actually think it backfired because I think people passed simply based on, on their grit. And maybe that was Pavel's thing. Maybe Pavel, you know, he wanted that Russian bravado that you're going to pass because of your grit and not necessarily good coaches. I'm not saying there weren't a lot of great coaches. There were. And many of those coaches are still very involved in the kettlebell world. But I think a lot of people just slipped by because they were tough. For sure. You know, it, what's interesting, too, as you mentioned this, <clears throat> what was so appealing to me, because, you know, I, I was familiar with the the RKC track and it gave me and, and you you even had a CrossFit gym in Philly where you did your stuff, but you weren't the typical CrossFitter, if you will, in my opinion, uh, where like it was it was all about kind of this this competition and like, you know, and so purist about things where like you created kettlebell athletics. And really what it was is. Let me just show you how to use this tool. You don't have to use it exclusively, but it's a great tool to use for general fitness and uh, with body weight and other tools. Um, it just it was a really accessible. I, I think what you're describing is basically your experience was like, you know what? I like this, but I don't I don't like all of it, and I'm just going to make my version of it. And uh, again, you know, I, I don't mean to disparage CrossFit. It's just that anytime things are super competitive, but then there's there's a high skill thing involved things can get pretty dangerous and or like you said you know now it's just about people that are fit versus people that actually want to learn yes. how to use it how to teach it um so that's why i was attracted to to more of your side of things because again I, I i wasn't planning on just using a kettlebell only for the rest of my life right bj you and i both i believe we hate dogma yes and unfortunately i know you used the word cult early on in our conversation today and I think there's a positive, there's a, you know, our word culture comes from cult. They're very, you know, they're united. Those words mean the same, sort of the same thing. But there's there's dogma as well. And there's accepting stuff just to accept it because somebody said it was so. And I, I hate dogma. I hate dogma in the re religious world. I hate dogma in the political world. I hate dogma in the exercise world. If you show me a better way, if you show me techniques that are smoother, more efficient, more energy conservation, all that, I'm going, I'm going to do Bruce Lee, take what is useful and get rid of the rest. And that was frowned upon um, early on. But I've, I, I don't know how many workshops I've taught with kettlebell athletics. It has to be in the thousands, I would imagine high 100 high hundreds for sure one of the best testimonials i always receive is you are open to accepting rejecting flirting with playing with options right and it's not just one style hard style soft style correct style wrong style it's here's bj and here is uh, Nina G. Jones. BJ has a different training history. BJ has different hips. Nina's got different hips, right? Yes, she does. Yes, she does. does. Those Boricua hips. Ooh, everybody's different. So th to apply the same training methodology for each individual, I think was uh, not my style. It's never been my style. And I think that's where kettlebell athletics really shined and people appreciated it. I was always open. I'm always, BJ, 
I consider myself a good teacher, but beyond being a teacher, what I really consider myself is a student. And unfortunately for my wife and some probably some other individuals in my world, if I want to know something, I'm going to research the shit out of that thing. If you and I are having a conversation right now and you say mass equals force times acceleration, I'm going to go and research mass times mass equals force times acceleration in 46 different resources just so I can know that I'm not talking shit, right? And it's the same with the kettlebell world. I'm going to absorb as much as I can from Steve, from Pavel, from John, from Valerie, from uh, Andre. We even had a guy from Estonia come. We knew a guy from Estonia. His grandfather came and we met at a park and he showed us these really cool techniques and some theory and philosophy. And it was like the best afternoon of our lives. We're hanging out with this old guy, right? And uh, his form was completely different than what we were exposed to. People are open to different styles. Exactly. You mentioned uh, dogma, which again, like, is such a turn off to me. But also, the egomania. Like, if you, if you if you were typical, oh, by the way, like you had you had the talent, you had the looks, you had the skill to be a guy that could develop the Jason C. Brown method. You know, like it's it, that's that's what these guys do. It's like they put their name method it's like this is me this is you got to do it this way and you know you and i about i would have the gadur method you know because i'm it's all about my legacy right but we we acknowledge the fact that this is we're in a long lineage of people uh by the way you talked about you know the naked naturalists the greeks thousands of years ago were doing stuff like this uh you know basically the early the early olympics and uh, physical culture was put at the level of anything any other artistries or our artistic pathways uh or knowledge uh obviously we live in a society where we we we've, we've gutted physical education from our schools uh we don't have safe communities where people can learn about their bodies and i just did a podcast about this where because one thing i always remember from you too it's like we were at a, a conference or event and, and you looked at me and like bro i don't know how you do it how do you how do you do fat loss you know because the thing is, when you when you have to, uh, here's the fact: the fact that we actually have to teach or program fat loss in this country is endemic of the, the the overall structure of it, right? People don't know how to use their bodies, and in reality, we're living in this Ozempic age. It probably is the only answer for people that are 50 percent body fat over 40 because they're so far gone, and they already like they don't they can't make it their life. Uh, so it's it's almost impossible for it to be a lifestyle where, you know, um, and, and I, I, I know you've done it with your kids, you know, uh, whether you, uh, you know, they're using kettlebells or not, just you're the example you set in your house, you know, the, the, the daily walks, you have a strength garden uh, inside and outside of just these uh, classic training tools, timeless, no trends, no gimmicks, no bullshit. This is how you move your body. You push, you pull, you swing, you squat, um, you get up, you know, um, so Moving into this, what, what attracted you to kettlebell? Like, you know, obviously, I, I want to kind of quickly describe the difference between a kettlebell and a dumbbell, besides the, the obvious look of it. Um, and you know, there's unique advantages to it in terms of the flow, the versatility, um, grip, overall power, posterior chain or backside development. Um, you know, but it's it's a higher skill thing. Like, I. I I, I lean more to, towards programming dumbbells, especially online, because again, I just know, you know, with uh, with a higher skill comes a higher responsibility and higher risk. So, uh, tell us about you know the battle of the bells. Like, why why would you use one or the other, um, and why do you think do you think both are good? Like, just take me through your thoughts on that. I do think both are good, and if I could talk at the end, BJ, about another tool that I fell in love with would which would be the CMB or the center mass bell from Sorenex. Yes, that's or, a good one. Uh, the, uh, Donnie Thompson calls them fat bells. I prefer the CMB from Sorenex because both ends are open, but we can talk about that. So the kettlebell is different because it provides something called an extended moment arm. It depends where you study biomechanics. Some people would say lever arm. 
I went to Temple University in Philadelphia. They called it moment arm, moment arm of resistance, moment arm of, uh, oh my goodness, effort. So I'll just show you the dumbbell right here. When I pick up the dumbbell, the center of gravity is centered in my palm right here. I may have a little bit of this going on, but there's nothing above my hand or below my hand. So this center of gravity is pretty fixed within my palm. Now, if I have a kettlebell, depending on where I am within the movement, it has an extended moment arm of resistance. So what that means is the resistance is extended away from my palm. In some situations, it's actually a shorter moment arm of resistance. So whereas the dumbbell would be fixed here, if I choke up well on the handle of the kettlebell, it's actually a shorter moment arm of resistance. And then you can manipulate this a million different ways. If we're snatching, it's actually called a variable moment arm of resistance because sometimes it will be shorter when I receive the bell overhead. Sometimes it will be longer when I'm in the movement of the snatch. But then you can do all these little things that I fell in love with you know, working with my jujitsu guys who need strong wrist and strong grip. You can got all this weird offset type of center of gravity work here. You got the bottoms up press, which is pretty classic. You got that, I call it an inside leverage press. I'm sure somebody else has a different name for it. Outside leverage press. Then you have all these little beautiful ways to hold the bell like this. Boom, the palm press. By the way, Russians believe that the palm press is the, the safest way to actually press because of the communication between all the receptors within your palm and your shoulder. Um, man, it's just, see this finger presses. This one is a huge one, BJ. I know you like boxing. I'm not sure if I ever showed you that, but they would press off the thumb. Boxers would oh, actually wow. press off the thumb like this to strengthen it against that eccentric, you, you know, that contraction. Maybe if you missed it, you hit people with the thumb instead of the full fist that hockey players do that type of stuff as well. So it's a beautiful tool. I mean, with one tool, if we were just talking about one exercise, like overhead press, we could probably get like six variations of one thing. And that's not even to speak about, like if we could do the Arnold variation, we could go straight up, we can do the side press, bend press variations with it as well. Did that answer your question, Master BJ? Oh, I mean, it did. So just to uh, unpack that, just you unlocked about six to eight different gripping styles that like, again, you can't really, you, you know, I see bodybuilders, oh, you grab, uh, if you hold your hand, you take a dumbbell, right? And you're trying to do curls and you put it to the outside like this. Yes. That's going to increase the supination demand in the biceps, right? So you can, you can play with that a little bit, but you know, just, just right there, you saw where the kettlebell, again, with great responsibility, uh, with great variety comes great responsibility, right? Because, you know, if you're going fast uh, on some of those movements, you can hurt your hand, your wrist, your shoulder. But you can also add resilience by strengthening through these unconventional angles. So, again, this is the pros and cons. Like, you know, that's why, like, maybe start learning to get up with a dumbbell or a water bottle before you hold on to a kettlebell because increased stabilization demands. But if you can do it with a kettlebell, doing it with a dumbbell or anything else is a piece of cake. Yes. And it, I actually start people doing get ups and windmills with a medicine ball. So they have that full type of palm, palm on total connection. Yeah. So I, 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 this here goes at that, back to that dogma. Like, oh, we're doing get ups. It must be done with a kettlebell. But if you look in the, within the historical record, people did get ups with a million different tools. Right? They didn't do it just with kettlebells. They did it with dumbbells, barbells, humans, right? They did yeah. it with all the, the whole menu of physical culture training tools, not just kettlebells. But when people associate get-ups with exercise, they think of a kettlebell. But it's not necessarily fact, right? And if you look in the historical record, BJ, which is one of the ways that I actually prefer to present this, I teach it from the top down. Because if you can teach the mechanics from the top down, people have a much easier time. I'm not sure if you've ever put somebody that's really out of shape on their back. Maybe they have a little dad gut. 
maybe they're a little bit overweight or something. You're like, get up. And they feel that initial roll to elbow, that struggle because maybe they haven't done that type of thing in forever. It shuts down their, uh, what's the word? Their desire because their first thing is has been a failure. But if you have them be successful right away from the top down, and then you get them to lie down and come back up, it's easier to teach from the top down. I, and you, see, you know, it's so interesting because, you know, one thing, so I, I learned to get up. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting too, I mean, it, it's also just like in, in practicality, it's so much easier for us to get down than to get up. And, and especially for people that have a lot of central fat, like, you know, around their belly, you know, getting in these positions kind of makes you insecure. Um, yes. You know, makes you kind of like, it, it just, like you said, um, so that that's interesting. And, and I, what I always love too, um, I've taught thousands of people how to do get ups by breaking it down into the stages, you know, really kind of, you know, even as simple as going from just uh, back to forearm, then forearm to hand, then bridge, then leg sweep, then lateral hinge, then overhead lunge, and, and so breaking those kind of, and I learned that from you about just breaking them down into these sections. Um, but I've usually done it from the ground up. Um, so I, I, it's really interesting that that kind of top-down approach, because uh, again, we, we are stronger eccentrically than we are concentrically going down versus going up. So I, that's a real interesting insight. But I'll tell you, people, um, I get really discouraged sometimes because I, I teach it. It's, it's a staple. It's one of my core movements. Because again, like we know uh, there's two big predictors of longevity, grip and being able to get up unassisted. If you can do these, if you have a strong grip and you can get up unassisted, you, you can have quality of life for as long as you're here. It's not about living longer than other people. It's about while you're here until that last day, you want to be able to do things and not be in pain. Um, and, and the get up, it trains the plank, the hinge, the squat, the lunge. Uh, you get open chain and closed chain shoulder stability, every joint. It's like a lie detector test for the body. But you, people discount it because they think, you know, it's uh, it, it takes too much time to teach. Um, it's not sexy. It does expose. It does. And people don't like to be shown their weaknesses, you know. Um, but uh, we teach it. And I, I get so discouraged because it'd be like, what does this work? Hey, BJ, what does this exercise work? You're laying on your back. You're holding a weight overhead and you stand up. What's involved? This is a whole body exercise. Like, again, if you're going to pick one, this is the one. Um, and I, I think, honestly, the two best pairings are the get-up and the pull-up or the hang. Right. Yep. That, that one-two combination, man, like that's kind of all you need. That's like the minimalist approach we're talking about. Throw out the hundreds of exercises and just focus on these two. And I promise you this, 80% of what you're looking for in fitness can be accomplished, um, especially, you know, like for time, we're talking cardio, metabolic. Uh, for lower reps, we're talking just pure strength. You can you can add speed to these things too. So um, this kind of bridges it right into the next piece here, which is uh, like, what are the top three mistakes people make with the kettlebells? And I'm not just talking the Jillian Michaels swing. Do you remember that one? Yeah, it's that like, was it's horrible. Like a long workout, and she does this like dive bomber swing, and I don't know how her spine didn't snap on sight. What, what was the question, BJ? Top top three mistakes? Yeah, or, yeah, or like. Oh, yeah. You know, top three most common kettlebell mistakes for uh, for beginners that you've noticed over the years. So beautiful, and you know, Pavel is still one of my favorite authors because he's so sharp with his language, but he's so sharp with his ideas as well. So one of them is don't major in minors. It's just what you said: pull ups, get ups, or hangs, and some some get up work it could be completely unweighted it could be just you know body weight whatever but don't major in minors sometimes we're all about the flows and we're all about the complexes before we've had a steady diet of basics right number one is this i really love this from pavel stop your complicated weakness Stop your complicated weakness. Look, I'm all about the artistic expression of human movement. I'm all about the art of expressing the human body. But sometimes you just need to swing. And then sometimes a 200-pound male should be able to swing a 32-kilo kettlebell before he's doing some fancy 
stuff. Maybe. I mean, if fancy stuff is your thing, I'm not going to discourage anybody. But I think sometimes, maybe, you should just get stronger or lift heavier weights. Number three, I think, would be going too intensely too quickly. I think there should be a nice little breaking in period. Many people have not, at least the general population, if you want to consider the, I consider kettlebells swings at least, let's just use the ballistics as a, uh, an example. I consider them a form of plyometric. A Russian would might say power metric, which I actually love that phrase, um, but they are quick movements. And they are plyometric. There's a fast eccentric, there's an amortization phase, and then there should be a fast concentric. A lot of people haven't done that since they were children. So I think we can we can be a little bit too intense. And I think we maybe should just have a good little break in period for the kettlebell skills. Oh, for sure. You know, one thing that also uh, I love I love the curriculum you set up uh, in your certification back in the day, which was you know, grinds versus ballistics. And this is what you're describing. Like you want to first learn how to do movements slow, pain-free full range of motion before you add speed to it. That, that's a staple of any training tool. Um, Cause if you can do it slow, it's much, it, doing things fast is easy. And then it's not going to come at the toll of the joints. But uh, I want to hear, I want to hear you kind of break those down, but also, you know, those listening to what Jason's talking about the plyometric piece. For a lot of people that have like foot, knee, ankle issues, right? Or if you're rehabilitating something, you still want to, you know, that's the whole thing when you get a lower body injury. Um, and I'm going to drop it into the link here too. One of my most popular videos on YouTube is the top nine upper body cardio exercises, showing people a way in which they can maintain their cardio when they have a lower body issue. It's tough. Um, but the kettlebell, like if you hurt your knee, for example, and again, it depends on the stage of the rehabilitation, something like a swing or a hang clean can allow you to engage a lot of your body, but use more hip than knee, but still get that cardio capacity. And they did research too, where they would test, you know, like eight minutes of swings, I think it was. And there was a similar cardio metabolic response to running, but without as much of the impact forces on uh, the lower body joints. Not that you can't hurt your back, because, you know, that's the thing about if you can't properly hip hinge a grind, doing a swing, which is a ballistic version of that, that, that can literally blow out your lumbar spine. So uh, can you talk to us about like the grinds and the ballistics and how you kind of respect that process with regards to progression? Great question, BJ. So a grind would be any slow controlled movement used for hypertrophy or strength. It would be, you know, an overhead press, a front squat, a goblet squat would be a very classic type of grind, reintroducing people or introducing people to a nice user-friendly squat variation front loaded type of thing. Uh, I consider windmills grinds. I consider Turkish get up grinds. Again, slow controlled movement used to develop strength and or hypertrophy. The ballistics are used to train a quality that I call power endurance. It could just be power if we keep the rep range low and the fatigue low, but usually kettlebells are done because there's somewhat of a, uh, somewhat of a light to moderate load um they're usually done for higher repetition so i the quality that i like to say they work best for is power endurance so those would be your swings your snatches your cleans full menu of all of those full you know 20 different stances you can take 20 different variations um but anything that's has an initial explosion at the ground level, and then you are just simply the guiding system to the overhead position or the rack position, just like a ballistic missile, right? Initial explosion at the ground level, you guide it into its target or that final resting position, that is what a ballistic is. Not a lot of tension, explosion at the initial impulse, and then you just guide it into the overhead or wherever you're going. And, you know, so one, one piece too, that I loved about your coaching style, because again, I, you know, I, I came from a very like powerlifting background. I remember, you probably remember, you know, uh, big dumb animal, young BJ in your, in your course. And like, I remember, remember how much I was struggling with uh, the clean. And, you know, one thing you showed me was uh, well, a couple of things I wanted to touch on that. Uh, the purist will only say you can clean in kind of the swing style, but you were like, no, we can go, 
uh, I think you call it rectilinear or just a yeah. straight vertical wave. As you, this is easier. This actually is less stressful on the spine. And I was still having trouble with it. But then you're like, you know what? Face the wall. And that's going to force me. I, I couldn't, you know, because what was happening was I was making it too horizontal and the bell was whipping back on me. And that can happen on cleans and snatches. But going up against the wall, it forced me to keep it more vertical. And then the other piece of it too is sometimes it's counterintuitive. Like sometimes a heavier weight leads to better form. You know what I'm saying? Like where if you're going too light on that clean or a swing, then it's it's out of control because you have too much power behind it. So there were, I, I unpacked, I guess the third thing I unpacked from your teachings was always go through stability progression to just load. Because, you know, people, people say, well, it's only 53 pounds. I, how am I going to get jacked? Well, no, you can start with a two-hand and go to a one-handed swing, or you can stagger your stance to make it more challenging to one side of your body versus the other without increasing the load and get more core, hip, shoulder stabilization. So again, like a lot of things when I was early in the game that like really influenced me in terms of how I program all tools. Um, so I guess that kind of leads it into, you know, what are your, what are the top five kettlebell drills um, to focus on or feel free to expand upon what I said as well? I, I think you and I share similar opinions. I think I really minimize cleans and snatches in my current current teaching because I think a lot of people do not like that learning period associated with the bell on the back of the wrist. But if you you do need to teach those so they have a larger menu of movements available to them. So I think clean swings would be number one, but they don't necessarily need to be number one because I have a lot of people start with the clean so they can clean and press, they can clean and front squat, they can clean and lunge, they can clean and step up. If they have a beautiful clean, that just opens up the doorways to many other variations that aren't necessarily within a kettlebell curriculum. So if they have a good clean, they can press, they can lunge, they can squat, they can do carries, they can do a million different things if they have a beautiful clean and a beautiful rack position. Pain free, right? Could you, so show I would actually, could, you, could you show it? Because this is how you get into the rack position. This is where it all, that's where all the fun starts, but you have to know how to get there. I'm not sure if you can see me, BJ. Can you see me? Yeah, you know what? Put uh, Take your screen and just put it down as low as you can. I can see the, the top part, but we'll just... Cut off your beautiful head for a second. Perfect. So you got the bell on the floor. There's a few different ways to do it. I'm personally doing the corkscrew version, but check this out. If I were to put my thumb forward here, it's much easier to clean as well. That's one adjustment that I really changed is instead of having people go, and I know you love this, BJ. Of course I do. Yes. Instead of, having, <laughs> instead of having people go thumb to bum, I actually have them go pink to the stink. That's horrible. Oh, you and I are going to get canceled, BJ. We're going to get canceled. So I'm instead of thumb to bum, instead of pointing the hair, I'll, tell me if this works, BJ. Don't look at my bald spot. Perfect. Yeah, usually people do thumb to bum, but I think it's a little, actually a little bit easier. If you have thumb four, look how easy that is. And you can go from here. Oh, it's right there. I'm bouncing around a little bit, BJ. I hope you can see. But I yes. think playing with the thumb position on your cleans makes life easier. And I think you can have it a little bit forward, more forward than behind. And then the rack position would be 45 here, right onto this nice little chubby nugget below the pinky, hypothenar or PC form if we're talking about the bone. And here, I actually like this. Can you see this, BJ? Yeah. This is one thing that I really disagreed with a lot. And uh, this comes from the RKC. They teach this, ripping the bell. But you see what becomes the fulcrum there? the back of my delicate little wrist. And if you're training anybody that has thin wrists, not a lot of meat on the back, that digs right into the back of the wrist. 
But if you use like a kettlebell sport type of grip here, just putting that knuckle onto the handle, you can lock it in the position. You can do whatever you want here overhead. And it's not going to come out. And you see, I think we missed it there. But this position here, just those beautiful little knuckles. Tuck it in. And, and you can do whatever you want. Get up, swings, uh, not swings, get ups, windmills, front squats. Right there. And technically somewhere, like if I can reach out and touch my chin, or usually they use the landmark of the fist right underneath the chin, that is the good rack position. And then that, couple, couple, sorry. Go ahead, sir. Just to add to that too, you know, you, you just just that movement to point out too. This is where this initially is no man's land in kettlebell training, right? You want to keep it tight and close to the body. Not that you don't want to train the ability to do this, but early on, uh, you know, I, I think also said the shoulder is the poison of the ear. I've heard that over the years. You want to keep the shoulder. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, that, that was another piece too. And just going to the gripping piece, um, I, I look at it the same way uh, with, with pull-ups and inverted rows. Like people over grip uh, and they squeeze the hell out of the bar. And I, I actually do a lot of thumbless, just kind of monkey smooth hook. Because what ends up happening is when you over grip, you're much more prone to elbow flexion, the biceps taking over instead of the lats or the elbow taking over instead of the shoulder and you get tendonitis and just pain. Um, so it, it's interesting that you apply that also just, it's it, that same concept applies to the kettlebell as well. Um, but yeah, just, I mean, that concept too of like, you know, I see people on the internet and they're doing like, they, they rip it up and they're catching it here and they're just like, I mean, not that we shouldn't be able to do it, that way, I guess you might encounter that in sport or athletics and competition, but to train like that under load, I mean, you're going to destroy the shoulder. Yes. So, BJ, this is technically the least stable position for the shoulder. Externally rotated, flexed, and abducted, horizontally abducted. This is, this is one reason why I believe every coach, teacher, trainer should study some form of martial arts because martial arts is our – Applied kinesiology. So if you are tucked in, just so I'm going to use a jujitsu analogy. If I'm tucked in like this, you're not going to shoulder lock me. If I'm out here, you are going to shoulder lock me. This is my favorite move. So why would I purposely put myself into this position? And like you said, maybe you want to train this position. So maybe I'm a little more resilient here, right? But in terms of a constant training stimulus, I don't think I want to be there, especially with that extended moment arm of resistance, because the center of the kettlebell is going to want to pull me into greater external rotation. So that's one reason why we actually offset it into an internal rotation a little bit. So the center of gravity is better there. And not this like a vertical forearm is a bad idea because eventually it's going to turn us into external rotation here's another thing about martial arts and kettlebells in jiu-jitsu there's a cool little phrase called hold the butterfly and you don't over grip because if you and i were wrestling wrestling's a little bit different but judo and jiu-jitsu if you and i were to tie up and if i grip you really hard i telegraph to you what I want to do. If I tie you up like this, you know I'm going to go for a particular move. But if I hold the butterfly, right, that's a, such a weird little analogy. If I just hold the butterfly, you don't necessarily know what I'm going for. And it saves me. It saves my fatigue. It saves my grip. This is true in the kettlebell world, but this is also true in the grappling world, probably the climbing world and the parkour world. Once your grip goes, it's gone. Once those forearm flexors go, once they are gas, once they're congested, once they are fatigued, you are screwed. When I was in the Marines, BJ, we had a uh, obstacle course, and the, the rope was the last obstacle, right? And I, I, would, I ran through this obstacle course as fast as I could. You had to get it in under two minutes. Two minutes was the mark. All these cool little obstacles. I ran through it as fast as I could. Dummy. I was gassed. I got to the rope. I was completely gassed. Guess who could not 
climb the rope the first time because I had no forearms left because you had to do all these other little obstacles. Once those forearms go, you're done. So save the fatigue, like you said, use the monkey grips, all that type of stuff, hold the butterfly, use mechanical advantages in your favor, and uh, enjoy your kettlebell trip. I love it, man. So uh, the, the clean, uh, the get up, you know, uh, get up. It rounds out that handful of movements that, you know, all beginners should spend most of their time repping on. Front squats. Goblet squats are huge. I love goblet squats. That's two hands on one bell. I do love unilateral front squats, like one bell, rack position. Perfect. Yes. I do love that. And I love, I just love the rack position because again, it's a gateway. You can lunge there. You can step up there. You can squat there. You can press there. You can do anything. You can carry sleds there. Um, swings, of course, but not maybe not necessarily just the bilateral two feet planted type of swing, maybe like the staggered stance that you mentioned. I call it a 1.5, but there's a million different variations. Um, swing, I maybe actually, I would actually start with the clean, clean swing, overhead press, I think is beautiful. Get up, get down, beautiful front squat, goblet squat. Love it. Uh, before we go into kind of some fit over 50 uh, stuff and then some Qigong breathing to finish out the episode here in about 20 minutes left here. Uh, can you just quickly like, just show me, this is where like, you know, let's just stop talking. Here's what I hate about fitness and we're kind of doing it in some ways. We're talking about it, but people just want to talk about it. They want to listen to it. They don't want to do it. Stop talking about fitness. Just be fit, do fit shit. Um, can you just show us quickly, just like in a minute or two, just a light bell, just all the different types of swings that you, you play around with and just, you know, what a good swing looks like. Um, because this, this is what blew my mind when I was working with you. It's like, oh, wow, like this is just, you'd never have to set the bell down. You can just no. keep going and flowing. It, it, it's just, a, it's beautiful. It's almost like uh, it's an art form. BJ, I, I apologize about the spacing here. But this, so can you see my hips, BJ? Yeah. So this would be the most classical. This would be like a hard style. This would be like um, RKC or strong first. So it's this hinge here and then one hike and then go. And that's the full hip extension, full knee extension. This left arm, 20 to 30% of our, our extension actually comes from this shoulder extension, shoulder flexion. So this would be the standard. I'm doing single arm because but my favorite is this, which will be a tough style or a gear voice sports way. Can you see the hips, BJ? Yeah. And I actually like to rock back on one heel. And if you notice, it doesn't change my respiration at all. It doesn't change my heart rate. This is the cool thing about swings. You can actually do a hard style swing for your work period. And you can do the soft style swing for your uh, recovery period. So I'll just demonstrate that real quickly. Our style would be, in CBJ, you're good. This is your work period. And then, this is my recovery. Work. Recovery. Make sense? Yeah, you're, you're basically just you're, you're, you're lengthening the rep to get a little more of a breather in between repetition. Yep, and you're using more, I would call it more elastic energy, more of a pendulum type of swing where it actually has, so a hard style swing would have, um, one flexion, one extension. So it looks like this. Just like a Romanian deadlift, right? So we're here. One flexion, one extension. One flexion, one extension. The soft style has one, two, one, two, one, two. And that's actually a Qigong move, BJ, called the pump. Much more fluid. Much more fluid. Much fuller. And there's people that do hundreds and thousands of those swings. But then we can do the 1.5, which is my favorite, actually. 
and the way that you line up here. BJ, can you see the feet? Are a little bit hard to see the feet. Feet are perfect. All right, so feet together, out 90, in 90, then half the length of your foot. So. And that actually unloads the, the spine a little bit for people that have lower back issues. I have I have done that 1.5 stance or stagger stance, like you call it, with many people that have bad lower backs. No pain with the staggered stance, none whatsoever. And then from there, you know, you can do two hands. Some people go outside the legs. I don't stray much from those three there. Love it, man. Again, and one thing uh, before we move on to the next topic here, uh, um, and, you know, and I've encountered this over the years too, that where they'll say, well, you're locking your knees out at the top. Uh, some people say you always keep them soft. Some people say like, you know, get all the way up. Um, Case by case, what should be case by case, or just like what's comfortable to you? Case by case, I don't like going overhead. I don't think many people have the thoracic spine mobility to do it, or the glen, you know, the shoulder mobility to do it. And I understand why a CrossFit world would do that because they need a standard the upper arm alongside the ear in order to count each repetition. I totally get that, but I, I don't think there's a need to do that for the Non CrossFit athletes. What about knees soft versus knees straight at the top? Case by case basis. I have some people that absolutely love the softer swing. They have fallen in love with it, and that is their go to specifically because it is not a high tension swing. They like it because it gets them into that flow, it gets them into the movement. And it's less taxing for their connected tissues and, and their knees and stuff like that. Now, if I'm training a young lacrosse player and I want them to have greater hip, knee, and ankle extension, maybe I'm going to have them straighten their knees a little bit more. But for that over 40 crowd, maybe we have a little bit more mileage on us. I think we can keep it soft. Love it. And that's great stuff, man. So moving into kind of this uh, longevity piece, evolution piece uh, with age, uh, you know, we had a conversation uh, last week, a little FaceTime caught up. Uh, and, you know, we were just talking about how, like, the way we do things today, like, and, and it's really, uh, it's mostly practice. You know, like, we pepper sets in throughout the day. I call it EHO every hour on the hour. Some people call it micro dosing, mo micro dosing movements. Others call it, uh, you know, Pavel, I think, called it greasing the groove, um, you know, and uh, you're, you're the same way. You know, just you kind of you, you hit a minute five to ten times throughout the day, whether it's hourly or just, you know, on feel or just walking by a pull up bar or, you know, just getting up off your chair at your desk hourly to prevent that stiffness. Um, and then any training you can do. Great. But at least you establish this movement base. Um, so we do that. And then we do the daily walk, you know, and and. Uh, so I wanted to kind of hear more about that, how, how it's evolved for you, you know, why you approach things this way, but also like, you know, a big part of uh, how I've seen people train with kettlebells over the years too, is, you know, they'll do like 10 to 20 swings hourly. And then you yeah. have like a hundred to 200 reps by the end of the day uh, of skill practice, uh, cardio metabolic, uh, you know, or calorie burning. Uh, you can take it to your, your office, you know, um, it travels well. So kind of talk to us about like what fitness looks like, for you uh, today, maybe how it's changed over the years. BJ, let me give you a quick story about greasing the groove. So before I went in the Marines, I, I prepared incorrectly. I thought powerlifting was the best way to go in. <laughs> it, it took my pull-up numbers down to like four. I went in at like 245 pounds. When I came out, I was 183. I was wow. dumb. I, I thought I should have gone in as strong as possible, but Somebody let me down in the preparation. I'm not blaming any particular recruiter, but they should have let me know, right? So I went in being able to do four pull-ups, trying to pull up 245 pounds. And the Marines have, pull, at least in boot camp, they have pull-up bars in front of the bathrooms. And the Marines are called heads. I, you have to make a head call. You're not allowed to make a head call. You're not allowed to go to the bathroom until you do a set of pull-ups. 
Wow. And they have you hydrate all day long. You got to drink all day long. So you're going to the restrooms quite a bit. I went from four pull-ups to 23 pull-ups. Now, there was a few factors because I did lose a lot of my muscle mass and I did lose a lot of weight, but I went from four to 23. And I attribute a lot of that to that, that hourly greasing the groove. Just And I never did failure. It was just like three, five, seven, 10. I wasn't doing 23 each time I walked by the pull-up bars, but I, I really love greasing the groove. And I continue to do that now, BJ. I'm sure it drives some people in my life crazy but like i'll get up off the couch every hour push-ups pull-ups and you know, some joint mobility type of stuff but usually it's a body weight squat because i th i just think those are so valuable to the human push-ups just because i like a strong upper body and sometimes they're just like a you know lateral flexion something like that just to awaken the spine a little bit but this is something that i got from dan gable the wrestler he said, if something is important, you do it every day. If something's not, don't do it at all. So wow. just like you said, the daily walk. Is walking important? Yes. Is it important for about 1,200 different reasons? Yes. Is squatting to the human animal, is that important? Yes. So squat every day. You don't have to train. You don't have to exercise every day. But you should squat every day. You should limber up. You should get mobile. You should, you know, do all your little squat mechanic stuff just to bring back that human animal. Um, the walk is essential. So I don't train very intensely myself anymore. Most of my training is done greasing the groove or, or I love, I love EHO, how you, how you rephrase that. I really love that. It's EHO. And then if I'm with other training partners, for maybe I'm like at the jujitsu school or I'm with my meathead, my son's meathead lacrosse team or something like that, then Papa Bear has to come out and show them that he can still deadlift and shit like that. But in terms of like longevity, it's, it's the basics. It's the playful stuff done daily. I love that, man. Again, you know, it's all about making it easy. You know, that's, that's what habit building and lifestyle is all about. And obviously again, like, we have a unique ability, you know, you've got your bar there. I've got my bar. I've got, you know, everything I need is right. My office typically we have the door pull-up bar on there too. So that again, it just, it's within eyesight. I walk by and I do it. Here's one of the, my, my latest ones that's like really helping because, you know, we, we uh, particularly for the, the hip, again, a ball and socket joint, people don't really take it through a lot of that open chain movement. So what I did is beyond just keeping my dog out of the kitchen, you can see the dog gate, right? Yes. Thou shall not pass and left you lift lift a leg. <laughs> so, you know, just throughout the day, you know, we're going in there. I water every hour. I water my body every hour. Um, you know, lunch, dinner. Like my my wife hates it, you know, because she doesn't like to lift a leg. But I'm like, you gotta lift the leg. And what it's done, people will start. You'll do it and like, oh my god, like all the clicking and cracking. You hear? Well, that's early stage arthritis. Yes. You don't have to have had a hip injury or have done powerlifting to you know, be on your, your way to a joint replacement. And, you know, one of the ways to fix that is a simple thing like that. Take a dog gate. I'm not asking you to do any additional exercise, but thou shall not pass unless you lift a leg and then make sure to do it on both sides. Okay. And then throughout the day, you go there 10 times, you, you 10 quality, slow controlled reps. Um, beyond that, you know, go, we talk about going into the pool to heal the body, which not everybody has access to the water, you know, but people can buy a $50 bar to hang from to just decompress their spine and open up their shoulders they can put a, a gate at, as a, in an entry area that's commonly traffic just to ensure they're lifting a leg to offset a lot of the hip pain that people are dealing with later in life that makes squatting impossible walking um not fun because it hurts so uh, you know th these are the things that again like I, I share sometimes this stuff i know you talk to people it's like okay but what about the workout you don't need to work out like I, I, do you watch uh, blue zones on netflix yes right so many takeaways but one of the common themes was people that are just uh you know people that live in, in hill areas right they're constantly they're constantly climbing uh, accelerating decelerating on, on hills or uh, gardening is a big part of the culture and they're always in a deep squat and, and it, because of that it becomes a position of rest 
not exertion. Where for, for Americans, like because we sit on tall toilets and you know in cars all day, uh, just the concept of getting down into a squat is just beyond us. So um, I want to kind of finish in talking about what you're working on right now. Um, really exciting kind of stuff with breath work and uh, obviously you, you're you got the BJJ background. You're just we're both big fans of Bruce Lee. Um, I think he's the goat uh, in a lot of ways, just because of he, he like that guy. What that guy accomplished and what he put in writing before he was he, he passed, I think at thirty six, just it's mind blowing. There also was he had ego, but it wasn't in. It never got in the way uh, of his teachings, you know, and that's tough because you know he was a superstar. Um, but anyway, you, you, talk to me about Qi Gong and, and the breath work, and obviously you're working with. Uh, trying to inspire some older clientele as well to kind of stay fit and uh, to kind of close it off. Like what you got going on. Uh, this has been fantastic, by the way. What a pleasure. BJ, thanks again for having me on. I love you. I hope you know I love you. I love uh, Nina G. Jones as well. Just to go back to the kettlebell real quick. If you have the art of expressing the human body by Bruce Lee, I think I forget, it was written, I think, in the 70s. The original version he speaks of kettlebells he actually has a hand-drawn uh diagram of kettlebells and the art of expressing the human body that's how on bruce lee was like where did he find that russia like what the hell right so qigong this is my definition there's going to be some dogma out there perhaps this is uh, chinese martial arts and internal martial arts they have that guru type of sifu, let's say, you know, the, it has the gatekeepers just like the fitness world has the gatekeepers. My definition is the art and practice of cultivating life energy or life force. So qigong is usually like a cultivation of life energy or vital energy, but I'd like to be a little more poetic with it. So it's the art and practice of crafting and shaping life energy. Because BJ, you know, you are one of the most energetic human beings I know. But entrepreneurs, the world in general, they're always talking about time. Time is money. Time is, life is time. Time management. Dude, it's not time. It's not time. If I wake up at 5 a.m., I honestly get more done by 8 a.m. than 99% of the people that I know. I wake up at five, I take my cold shower, I have my black, strong Brazilian coffee. I love my coffee like I like my women, <laughs> right? And energy, it is energy management. It is energy is the currency of life. It is not time, right? So that's why I really love Qigong because it is honestly, that's the most, it's like energy work. It depends on how deeply you break down the definition, but it's like energy work or vital energy, life force work or skill or cultivation. But I like to make it a little bit more poetic. And then the three things that you focus on is the body, movement, this type, you know, sort of like, a, so qi, qi kung is the large category, like if we were to say yoga, and then tai chi would be like, a stunga, if that makes sense. There's body, breath, and spirit. It gets translated to sometimes it's translated as mind, but those would be considered like the three treasures of a good qigong practice. What would be uh, like? Let's let's leave us. We, we, you know, we'll get you back on at some point. We'll do a full podcast on this. Could you send me some materials? I'm gonna research and check it out as well. Because again, like I'm I'm heavy into breath practice now because I've really bought in. And those listening as well, I'll pop in my. Uh, other the episode we do the top 10 uh, tips for beginners learning how to breathe or retrain their breathing mechanics uh, great episode one of our most popular ones of the year uh, but give, give us like give me an exercise I can start working on today that's you know simple that people listening can kind of uh, use as well so the one of the and this is good because it's it's cross-pollination of the kettlebell world and the qigong world and it's called the pump and 
through your study of the kettlebell, there's two types of breathing, right? There's a biomechanical match and there's an anatomical match. And the biomechanical match would be from like your bio, your, your boxing, psst, 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 right? And then the anatomical yoga is a great example of an anatomical match. As the arms go overhead, you inhale. As you reach into the forward bend, you exhale. The anatomy matches the breath or the breath matches the anatomy, right? Qigong is very similar to a kettlebell swing, this movement called the pump, but it's a beautiful exercise in breathing as well. So I'll try to get it here, BJ. I actually just did it with the kettlebell when I demonstrated the soft, uh, soft style swing. So can you see my hips? Yep. And it's just this, but in, out, in, out, in, out. Now there will be variations. I can walk back onto my heels. And you can make it vigorous. You can exhale as much as you want. I sent you some, uh, I sent you some Qigong for longevity videos. That's hardcore stuff. But there again, there's like there's gentle, flowy type of stuff, and then there's Qigong for the BJ Gadur warrior spirit as well. Right? And then that's one that's called the pump. But then there's like a, I actually do this with the kettlebell as well. So it's here. I don't know if you can see my feet. Can you see my feet, BJ? No, not the feet, but we saw the arms. All right. So the arms again, feet. So this is still a pump. So as the arms come here, inhale, exhale. Basically, any time, and this is Russian Russian uh, martial arts get into this as well. They say, let the body breathe itself. So it's that anatomical match. Anytime that the body is being compressed, you allow it to compress the air out. Anytime that the body is expanding, you allow the body to inhale on its own. So it's a beautiful way to match movement with breathing. And a lot of people consider it like a, a movement meditation. It's a, it's really gentle for the older population, but you can make it you can make it warrior ish as well. Oh yeah, yeah. you sent me some clips of this guy just doing some. I mean, it can be as uh, explosive and dynamic as you want, or it can be as gentle. Again, that that's any good style of exercise, right? It has that ability to take that dimmer switch all the way up, all the way down, and everything in between. Yes, and I think the the. Although in an indirect way, most fitness camps have energy as their focus, but it comes from like a depletion type of thing. And after a good Qi Kung session or practice, you should have this beautiful little buzz going on. And it's not taxing at all. It actually, it's like a direct experience. You and I spent 20, 30 minutes doing Qigong together. You are enlivened. You are energetic. Now, if we were to do 30 minutes of kettlebells, we would have to probably recover, right? It's a net gain of energy in Qigong. And then immediately, whereas most exercises deplete, you know, and then that's super compensation. But Qigong, that's not present, at least in my world and, and many people that I work with, they feel the immediate effects. Where can people find out more about you, follow you, what you got going on? We'll drop it in the show notes as well. JasonCBrown.tv. You can check it out. The dot com was taken and the, the guy won at $4,000 for me to buy my domain name. So just Jason Brown, Jason C. Brown TV. But if you just Google Jason C. Brown, I'll come up. There's a few actors with my name, adult, uh, adult film stars. No relation. <laughs> but, uh, just Google Jason C. Brown and all my work will come up. Iron Kimono on Instagram if uh, if anybody's on Instagram. I love it, man. Look, uh, if you're listening, we gave you 90 minutes uh, of what I believe was a master class and, and kettlebells and just the overall mindset and lifestyle of, of physical culture and education. So take a second out of your very busy day. Take your index finger. Just click the like button. Takes a second. Now, if you're on iTunes and Spotify – and you want to just give us, you know, make our day and give a five-star rating and review, uh, just say BJ Podcast good, okay? I don't need a novella. I don't need 
a long, you know, just BJ podcast. Good. Just helps us get the word out about this. Obviously, if you're on YouTube, like, share, subscribe. Hope you're enjoying the video podcast format. Again, it's, it's one thing to talk about it, but Jason demonstrated so many great things today that kind of complemented what we were speaking about. So hope you guys enjoyed it as well. And again, thank you, Jason, uh, for your time. Again, I only bring on people that, uh, you know, I truly respect and that I've learned from. And because and, if I can learn from them, I know you can learn from them. And, uh, you know, this is the guy that got me into kettlebells. He's also going to be the guy that's going to get me into uh, Qigong. Because you got me intrigued, man. Because, again, I've seen the power of breath in the last three to five years, what it's done for me in terms of, uh, you know, stress management, uh, recovery, and just, you know, not being so uh, wound up so tight like I used to be. It's, it's helped tremendously. And I now, like, I enjoy movement more than ever because I'm not getting so exhausted because I couldn't breathe. So uh, really awesome stuff. Thank you for listening. And uh, Jason, you want to close us out? Any closing words or thoughts? Yeah, I love you. Thank you for having me on. If anybody needs me for anything, I'm here. Much love, man. Thank you guys for listening. And uh, be sure to follow JCV. He, he is a legend in this game. I, I truly mean that. Links to everything we talked about in show notes. Peace.